Welcome to another series of CAN seminar uh, presentations. For today, uh, we are indeed privileged and uh, honored to have Professor uh, Sohail Nazarian from University of Texas at El Paso. Uh, Professor Nazarian is a great friend and he's actually uh, very close to our field and all the work he's been doing on pavements and recently some railroad track work. Uh, Professor Nazarian has been working uh, to teach us how to actually use seismic testing, non-destructive testing techniques to take advantage of these techniques in payment analysis, payment, uh, well, instrumentation and design and uh, especially recently I think he's been getting into more uh, into intelligent compaction as I, as I know and he's the inventor of several devices including Payment, uh, seismic payment analyzer, uh, that that being uh, one, and with his expertise in non-destructive testing over the years, he's been really a very much sought-out person by many agencies. By uh, you know, these are government agencies as well as consultants, as well as uh, academicians or <coughs> researchers like us, so all over the world. He and I also uh, work together and serve on the Transportation Geotechnics Committee uh, of the International Soil Mechanics and Geotechnical uh, uh, Engineering uh, Organization. And uh, it's indeed great to always listen to him and his practical approaches. DOT people basically love him from the perspective of how he comes with solutions to real life problems. And I think that's what as engineers we need to be doing in the first place. So with that, uh, I would like to introduce, uh, I would like to uh, uh, have all of you join me to actually welcome him uh, to give his presentation today uh, on payment construction, quality acceptance, migrating from traditional methods to performance management. Good afternoon. It's Thanks for coming and thanks for the invitation. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here and I'm a little bit nervous. One of my mentors sitting over here, so. So, <laughs> so I, 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 I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, the red part can probably says that, you know, the, de the devil is in the details. So uh, the concept that I'm going to talk about to you is very, very simple. The concept, we're going to talk for the first couple of minutes, five minutes about the, the concept. Very, very simple. Everybody knows it. And then I'm going to expand on this one by one, why it gets complicated and uh, why it gets difficult to implement. And sometimes we have the solution, and sometimes we don't have the solution. And we have all the brilliant minds of the University of Illinois over here. We can find a solution together, right? So um, have that in mind. So what is uh, what I would talk uh, in the next uh, maybe 45 minutes is what's performance management? You know, uh, this is coming out of the Minnesota DOT performance management. This is the new buzzword. You know, uh, where we are now, where we would like to go, and. Uh, some of the tools that we have a little bit, and then uh, there are barriers. You know, there are technical barriers, and there are institutional barriers, and we, unless we overcome these, uh, uh, I will be going around the universities making these talks, and nobody in the Department of Transportation will look at it. So let's, uh, uh, let, let's consider that. You know. I guess the the young audience, the first thing that, you know, somebody has to use, you know, the biggest uh, compliment you get when somebody uses what you do. Okay, so <laughs> let's see what it is. So let me see if what we are talking about. I'm just a little bit focused on the pavement materials now. You know, it doesn't matter what it is. It can be in our industry asphalt. It can be soils, bases, stabilized, not stabilized. Okay, this is how we work. A guy sits in an office and decides what the modules of that material is. That's the designer. The joke I have, that's a wedding planner. You know, that, you know they, there's, there's no, there's, usually they, they use your experience or they come up with a, with, with a number. Uh, uh, doesn't matter what the materials are, the constituents, uh, if it's a base, uh, it's probably 30, 
thousand psi or forty thousand psi modulus. You know? Okay. And then there's a guy who works very, very hard in the laboratory, and they, they think that it's an anvil, right? You know, they just they put the dirt in the mold and compact it and make sure that you know it doesn't crush the right size, the size, right uh, image. Huh? Essentially, that I was put it that they make sure that the material is durable. Based on the experience that we had, we know how to get a durable material. But there is no, no talk of, uh, of uh, what's the modulus of this material. Uh, when it gets out of the lab, there is no talk. And then the next step, the, the last guy that gets involved in this uh, triangle is the, basically the inspector. Okay. The density, the inspector, just make sure that you get the, the right density. Okay. What's the right density is arbitrarily defined around 40 years ago that whatever I get from Proctor in the laboratory. Mm. So that's the definition, uh, definition of quality. Of course, there's a lot of experience. I don't want to diminish experience. You need the experience to, to build the right, right. So this is what we are doing uh, right now. And uh, uh, the concrete guys are the ones who are farthest from here. If, if I want to make the analogy, uh, it just basically just come, uh, the, the design, forget about it. This guy you know, just assumes how much is the concrete should weigh. And this guy is just basically accepting it by the kilo. OK, so, so you've got enough material, basically. So where would you want to do? We want this guy uh, that is doing the design, you know, would just uh, assume a modulus, whatever it is. And we want this guy in the laboratory, make sure that he's getting that, that value. Or you can go back and negotiate with this guy. OK, I cannot give you that. Uh, if, I, if I can give you 40, what can you do for me, you know? Sometimes these guys are uh, probably from one side of the city to the other side of the city. You know, they're not in the same room. And then we want to make sure that this guy is getting, the uh, inspector is getting that, 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 that value, or he cannot get it in the field. OK. So, so let, let's do something, you know. So these three, they can, they, if they start talking to, to, with each other, we're going to be in heaven. Doesn't happen right now. Oh, OK. So that's, that's, uh, that's what we are trying to do. So, uh, so the next step comes to the, the concept of performance management, you know, the big picture, uh, just not quality control, quality assurance alone. It's a paradigm that, you know, first of all, make sure that, you know, the uh, material is performing as you expect. Okay. And with a defined risk for a contractor and for the agency. Nothing in our uh, world is perfect, so there is always risk involved. As long as you know how much you are risking, it's, it's fine. You know, but when it becomes uninformed, you know, that's, that's when it is. So the bottom line, we want the three legs that are the three groups that I showed you, they uh, talk to each other. What's the performance? The first thing we have to do, we have to define uh, performance. And I, and I mentioned it before, the performance is uh, predefined. You know, the agency decides or somebody decides, I want a payment to last 20 years. And then we have to hopefully come up with all the details in between to make sure that what we are doing would give you a, a 20. Uh, uh, we, at this current, uh, not perfect, but the closer thing that we can do, we have to settle on a design methodology. Let's not. Uh, interchange methodologies. You know, all of them are good and they need, we have experience with it, but we need to settle on one. We need to define what parameters are important in that mix in design that we are following. You know? And again, if you change the design, the important parameters change. And then we just focus on the constituents that uh, are the most important in the quality control. The, uh, I don't have a picture over there, but you know, if you go on a, any bridge project when they are pouring concrete, there are six inspectors making sure every uh, truck of concrete that's ready mix that comes in is in according to the compliance, the air, the, uh, so on and so forth. Now, 
there are guys on the rollers, they are putting three foot layers of embankment and just bless it by going over it once and there's not one single inspector over there. Guess what happens? <laughs> Why? Because that one is value added even though the life comes and the performance comes from the other one. So that's, that's the concept that we want to do. So the risk, you know, there are uh, several things you have to consider. A contractors have to make a profit. Uh, public deserve a well-performing road, so, 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 so both of them. You cannot uh, tip the risk into one, in the favor of one or the other one, or, or you're gonna have to. So you need to balance the risk between the, what the contractor, which is very conscientious, can do, uh, uh, and versus what the agency has to accept that you know you, it, nothing would be would be perfect. That's what they're going to do. The, we need to minimize the rehabilitation and maintenance, and I put premature. So if it's programmed, that's fine. You know, but if it's when it's premature, when they can come or something. Uh, type of contracts is very very important. Right now, it's become, uh, especially at least in the south, this is becoming a, a prevalent. You know, we have always done. Uh, uh, design, bid, build. This is what has been traditional. You know, the agency designs, uh, they just put a nice uh, document out and uh, somebody bids on it and builds it. The moment you say, I accept, you own it. Okay. Now, the one, uh, one side that uh, we can do is design, build, uh, maintain. So, it's green, it means that now yeah, the agency has less risk, right? Because if this guy skims, uh, the contractor skims during the construction, then they have to pay for it during the maintenance. Those are the projects that you see that the contractor goes out of their way to build the highest quality road because this becomes expensive if they don't do it. Okay. The worst that we can see, the most risk that you have when it's design build, you let someone design it and build it, but then you don't put a warranty or you don't put a maintenance agree uh, agreement with it, you know, because they are in control and as soon as, you know, they open the road, they are done and gone, huh? so, so you have to be. And we need to consider which layer is the most important. If you are putting a thin asphalt layer, it may be the base that is important. If you are putting 18 inches of asphalt, maybe the asphalt is important, you know. Depending on what you're doing and the, the traffic. Uh, and uh, I don't know how to do this, but you know, this is very ideal. There are some, uh, they are all good, but some are slightly better than the other one. I guess that's a political way of putting it, right? <laughs> Not all the contractors are uh, 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 doing. So if you have the past history, you know, uh, maybe that's something to, to consider. Let me talk about the. The, a little bit of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of what I mean, you know, let's say you have a three layer system, you know, this, uh, you have an asphalt over a base, uh, over a subgrade. Uh, the first thing you can do, you, you can go and see which parameter is the most sensitive to the remaining, the life of the pavement, right? All you do, you can do a Monte Carlo simulation, vary the thickness, vary the moduli and things like that, you know, reasonable and see and you can come up with an impact chart over here. This is just a random one. In this case, you see that is the modulus of the base uh, and uh, the, the modulus of subgrade are the two that the most important in the life of this one, equally important. So it means that most of my focusing inspection has to be these two layers. If I can get these more uniform and uh, better quality, I'm improving. Okay. So let's go and uh, let's go to the next one. Again, these are just getting to the details, right? Uh, and we are now focusing on this uh, modulus of the base. The next step is what parameter in that base that the contractor can control is important. Okay. So there are a number of parameters we come over here. The two of them that we know well is density and moisture. In, in this case, they came out. Not always, but sometimes, you know, if you have a, no fines, you know, maybe the moisture is not as important, the density is important, or sometimes there is some other parameter, the angularity, whatever. 
whatever impacts the modulus, right? And you guys do a lot of really good work coming up with those models, you know, and, and so on and so forth. So if that's the case, if the density is important, just make sure that, you know, control the density. If the moisture, let's go and do more and more of the, of the density. Right now there is one, one set of parameters that, that we do. Uh, and what you can do, first time you have to come to the t tolerances of acceptable variability. You know that everything would be variable. There is no question about it. So during the design, you can do a Monte Carlo simulation and see if, if the variability is 20% or 30% or 40%, that would impact negatively on the, on the, on the bottom line, the reliability-based life. Okay. So given the structure that you have, uh, come up with the acceptable reliability so that the, you, you, would, you would maintain. If it is too variable, then you would not have enough uh, with life with a certainty. And then combat with that one. Based on that, then you can look at the different methods and mo models that it, 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 would, it would fail. And then uh, based on that, we, uh, knowing the device that you want to use, because the variability in the device is important. The accuracy of the device, the robustness of the device is important. You can come up with how many samples to do. So this is pre-construction. And after the construction, you do the process control, you just the basic control charts of mean and coefficient of variation, both of them, as long as they go out of the control, you stop the operation or you increase the number of sampling and so on and so forth that, uh, so that you can, you can get it. It reaches a point that there are so many sampling that you know it's better to stop and see what, what is not under control and bring it to control. So this is the ideal world I'm talking about. So now let's get back to the performance, you know. We want to strike a balance uh, among several parameters, importance of the project, laboratory testing uh, effort, uh, field testing effort, and uh, analytical model that we are using. The more sophisticated the model that you use for, uh, for design, the more important the laboratory testing and the field testing becomes, you know, and more sophisticated it becomes. So, uh, so if you are going with the Ashdo uh, 72, there is no reason to listen to me any further. <laughs> if you are going with the level one uh, pavement ME, let, let's discuss, huh? So, so uh, hopefully uh, there is some money in a $100 million project to do $10,000 worth of laboratory tests. You know, this is the issue that, you know, is coming up over and over. Uh, so this is what we, 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 we consider as anticipated specification. So the first thing is selecting suitable material. This is uh, very important, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to get into that. Design, uh, select appropriate design parameters that uh, you're trying to, uh, to, to do for the model that you consider. You get the target field values. It can be moduli or whatever, you know, you're measuring. Uh, go and do the field quality control along with the process control. The more sophisticated the system gets, the more process control you need. For instance, I'm going to, in a second, get into the modular space specification. The more you go away from density and more into modulus, the more process control you need. Uh, some, sometimes there is an idea that now that I'm going to go to the modular space, then I'm not going to worry about the moisture and density or gradation. It's going to miraculously happen. It's not. Uh, we learn how, what the best practice is. And then the acceptance process, uh, uh, we're going to touch on it. Okay. So have that in mind, a stiff or a strong material doesn't mean that it's a durable material, right? If you want a very good stiff material, get a really good base material, add 15, 20, 30 percent clay in it and leave it under the sun. Boy, when you test it, it's going to be extremely extensive till the first rain, right? So, so be, 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 so make sure that the legacy information, the experience that we have is not lost because you are going from one process to the other one. Uh, please, uh, uh, we cannot go to performance type, you know, forgetting about the angularity, the type of material and things like that, because uh, modulus does not show those. I just, you need to 
estimate the appropriate design parameter. This is the standard uh, nonlinear one that you can. If you want to go uh, linear, uh, okay, so it gets a lot easier, but then the job of the uh, quality control gets a lot easier too, right? Uh, but they have to balance the other one. If, if you want to go and start getting more, more sophisticated, uh, anisotropic type things and things like that, you better have a way of checking that you're getting the anisotropy out of that. Now this is where one of the details that I was going to come. Uh, uh, the best way, you know, this one needs a parameter K1, K2, and K3 that comes from the laboratory testing. Uh, but uh, the best way to get it is run the laboratory testing on the, on the representative materials and so on and so forth. Uh, the second one, best one, if you don't want to invest in that, is just make a catalog. A lot of the DOTs are doing that right one. You know, they go to their quarries, they get the material, run the test, they have a catalog of representative. The third best is uh, estimating based on the uh, index properties. There are some models that, uh, that, that is, uh, is used. And then the worst one of these is just basically use presumpting values. Presumpting values is just pulling it out of your hat. You know, you don't, you don't know. So this is the process if you're, you want to use this model. If you want to use uh, just the linear elastic model, you know, just you need one number, right? And then uh, you can go get simpler and so on and so forth. Uh, so you can see. Now we need a target. Uh, one thing that we uh, we do, you know, the you have to target has to be related to the design. Whatever modulus the designer assumes, based on that and the thicknesses that they have reported, is that's what you need to know to get the target value. And again, how do you get the target from the same program that you use for the design? Because if you believe that's design program is working, you know, you get the target target from that. Now, some of the things you have to be careful, we get to the diesel. We are just, if you have a multi-layer system, and for instance, you are using a lightweight deflectometer, which has the depth of penetration of more than layer, then you, you want to use a multi-layer system. If you have a single uniform, if you're building an embankment and it's uniform, well, you have closed form solution, it's very, very easy. Uh, if you have more than two years, one we implemented is artificial neural network to predict what the, the, the thing would be. I would talk about that. And the output can be the modulus or deflection. If it's an LWD, I prefer deflection as a target. Why? Because the technician sees deflection. Modulus it has to go to an equation. So the target should be whatever the machine uh, measures. So, and then, of course, uh, do the testing. I'm going to go, I said, all relatively new testing. These are all, uh, at one time was new. I guess I showed my age, but you know, it's relatively new. Deflection based methods is getting more and more popular, uh, and everybody is uh, talking to each other. They're trying to improve the process. Seismic based, me based methods, that's the one I like the most, but it's least po less, less popular. So I'm going, to, I'm going to praise this method a lot, but uh, you guys consider that, you know, I like it better. That's my personal preference. Listen to the other people. That's all I'm saying, okay, <laughs> as well. So, the uh, the first thing that everybody is starting deflection man is a falling weight deflectometer uh, that they use on the finished pavement. Uh, just basically a load and seven sensors or ten sensors or whatever. I guess we have one parked over here in the backyard, right? Okay. Okay. I. Personally, do not like this. I like the machine. I don't like it for the quality control of the, the subgrade and base, simply because the loads are so heavy. That uh, that uh, interpretation of the results is very difficult. Uh, the uh, the lighter version of that, the lightweight deflectometer, I, I like it better because you know you're just getting closer to the state of stress. Have that in mind, you're still putting a huge uh, state of stress. You put 34 PSI on the subgrade. I don't think any of the subgrades sees 34 PSI in the lasting row. Uh, stiffness gauge has the advantage of being on the lo uh, stresses that are closer to what you see in the subgrade. Uh, you have to be a little bit careful with the seating. The seat, the, it's, it's a ring, and you know the material, when it's the material is rough, you know. 
the idea is uh, perfect, but you know, the material doesn't want to cooperate okay. with this one. So you can get multi-deflection and do back calculation. I discourage you from doing that because you have such a huge nonlinearity into the deflection basing that when you use a linear elastic material back calculate, you either can fit the end of, uh, uh, near the, the load and forget about the one away, or you can meet the ones away. You don't you don't get anything. So it would be uh, open to interpretation. And for the Q quality acceptance, anything that is open to interpretation means a referee. And if you have too many referees, uh, the method gets abandoned. So we prefer a single deflection, a forward uh, calculation, and instead of, again, even going to the modulus, just go to the deflection. You know, we can, inspector can see what the minimal deflection. This is the Boussinesq equation that we use for the single uh, question. The Poisson's ratio comes here. Uh, uh, as long as your Poisson's ratio is less than 0.45, this is uh, irrelevant. When you start getting closer to saturation, this become a, 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 a big, big player in what you're going to get. Uh, Q is the stress that you impose and the uh, diameter of the load plate. Uh, and then, of course, the smaller the diameter of the load plate, the closer you see to the surface, you know, so you can decide accordingly. And D is the deflection that is measured. Let me talk a little bit about seismic sonic. Uh, as a person uh, who has been working in this area since before most of the people learn, <laughs> it's been a while, since 1981, that's when I started working in this area. Uh, uh, you never talk to the engineers as the velocity because the velocity of propagation is what we measure. Uh, most uh, education, uh, undergraduate education, and most of the graduate education, nobody talks about wave propagation in the civil engineering arena. So, but modulus, everybody knows what modulus is. So, so I never go to a DOT and talk about velo shear wave velocity or velocity. I talk about modulus. And fundamentally from physics, modulus is a combination of mass density and velocity squared. Uh, what you measure is the initial tangent modulus. If you are with the familiar with the FWD, you are measuring probably somewhere between this one and E1 or E2. Most of your laboratory tests that you are doing, you are measuring E3 or E2. Okay, so that's the first uh, detailed question. Okay, what is the meaning of the modulus? Not all moduli are the same, right? Just make sure that you put something modulus, you know, in front of it, so that everybody knows. Uh, I, I, we do not design with the initial tangent modulus, so you cannot use that modulus in the, in the design. So this is the bottom line. If it, I, I look at wiggles, and I try to interpret this initial tangent modulus. Okay, so that's what we do. The one that we like is uh, using the surface wave. And the bottom line is that uh, let's consider the simplified model, a two-layer system. Uh, for the surface wave, uh, we talk about the uh, phase velocity, which is the propagation velocity, and wavelength. Up to a wavelength close to the thickness of the layer, if this layer is uniform, the modulus of this, uh, the, the phase velocity or the modulus should be constant. And below that, they start the transition zone at the, the, the very, 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 very long wavelength. We get back to asymptotic to this velocity. Uh, most of the t work that I'm going to talk about is to generate this part of it. We usually know by specification what the thickness is, so I'm just focusing from thickness up. So that will give me a luxury of having a layer-specific measurement, but only the top layer. And based on the assumption, the layer is uniform. So uh, this is the device that you use. It's basically a source and two receivers. And uh, I'm not here to teach wave propagation. So, so you collect the, the signals, and you go through the signal analysis uh, in, in, uh, to do some of the analysis. And then you get the dispersion curve. Velocity, now I change it to modulus because I don't want to talk velocity to uh, anybody with the equation I showed you. and then. 
you know what the thickness should be, so you just basically average the modulus over here over the thickness. Now, the first question is it doesn't matter. I'm going to, this was the background of the new technologies. So usually you see a lot of scatter in the field. So the affectionate thing that doesn't matter. Uh, if any tool that you use, there's a lot of scatter. So as soon as uh, people see scatter, uh, uh, they start blaming the manufacturer of the equipment. And they throw the equipment out um, uh, along with the operator and the manufacturer. Because in the eyes of the people who are sitting in the office, it's, uh, life is wonderful and it's a bunch of linear elastic, uh, perfectly elastic layers with perfect. So I, I, you measured here, you measured it 20 feet away, and there's a factor of three difference in the modulus. Goodbye. <laughs> we made it perfect, no? So, so we try into this. Is that device related or is it real? That's the first question. Um, and then how to consider the lab and the field uh, differences? Because what we prepare in the laboratory and just basically just to factor usually, or a variation of it. What we do in the field, we have a roller going over there, and these are different, different mechanism, different volume, and so on and so forth. How do we consider those? Those are. Different. Let me show you the first thing is the scale. Is the device? Is that the device or the material? Okay, so uh, this is uh, a, a couple of all your friends, you know, uh, making uh, as perfect as possible layer, single layer material. So this is a. Uh, uh, three feet in diameter by three feet deep. Uh, these poor guys, they empty, dry the, uh, the, dry the soil, put it two inch lifts in a, in a uh, uh, concrete mixer with the right amount of soil, compact it two inch at a time. Pick it up all the way to the top to do six or seven measurements, then they empty it and fill, fill it up again. No? So don't complain, or those who do triaxial on a six inch, don't complain, right? Okay, so we made them uh, make 20 of these guys. Okay, just 33, I guess, is statistically what I, I couldn't convince of. <laughs> the 33. So it's the same material, uh, very uniform, and uh, to, uh, to as close to perfection as it can do, okay. so. This is the, first of all, look at the average. This is the average, you know, you remember the linear elastic? Geo gauge, now you're getting more. Two LWDs, okay. First of all, look, the two LWDs are not reading the same number. I'm gonna get back to that, huh? So just because you went and bought an LWD, uh, You cannot just set a target and, and have two, two different LWDs at the side. You know, you have to have an LWD for a, perf uh, for a specific device. I'm going to get back to that. These are the details. So the other one is the standard deviation, right? This is one plus minus one, the standard deviation, 20, very well controlled. Okay. So if you look at them, all of them are just as equally good or equally bad in terms of the quality, uh, coefficient variation. It's 29 plus minus 5%. Okay. Okay. No. No problem. Okay. So, how do you control that? Because uh, again, we are doing the best we can to control the mo moisture content. But you know, you take the moisture content every two inch and put it in the in the in the oven, and you see that you cannot control it even in the laboratory, better than uh, around one percent. Okay. For this material, if you go from minus one. Uh, Probably I have the statistical. There were modulus when I change it plus minus two percent. There is three hundred times three hundred percent change in the modulus. So thirty percent relative to the three hundred percent is nothing. That we are any other machine that you know. So I I. I, I, I don't have it, but there is a paper in TRB, you know, I would be more than to share it, that they went through the ASTM standard uh, calculation of the, what's the machine variability, the operator variability, and the material variability, and you see that more than 80% of the variabilities, even in the control, is coming from the thing. 
So never expect to get a coefficient of variation of 10% uh, or less in the field, huh, if you want to go this way. Now in the same kit scenario, the density changes only 6% when the modulus changes 300%. So when you're a contractor, which one do you prefer? A material that you know, changes 6% or the one that changes 300%? <laughs> uh, a little bit of, uh, a little bit of uh, uh, unsaturated soil because this comes up uh, all the time. Okay. Uh, if you know that the, uh, at the optimal moisture content, at the, at the optimal moisture content, we, are, we usually have a degree of saturation of between 80 to 90 percent. Okay. If you get more than that, it's too wet, you know, we don't, desirable. And more than 100 percent is fiction, science fiction, right? Okay. So we cannot exist. So, and if you get too dry, uh, it's not very stable, right? And so I give it a 50, 75 to 60 yellow, and then below 55 is too, too soft. Okay. This is coming from the now, what I have over here is the moisture content versus the, the dry density. Okay. Okay. So, wherever is red is not acceptable because the suction is too small, huh? Is the, is the, uh, whenever is yellow is, is correspond to that one. And whenever is green is when I'm between 80 to 90 percent. Please look how much of a margin of error do I have to get that 80 to 90 percent. Very little. And uh, the high density, low moisture content is a base, so the moist I have to be right on if I want to implement uh, this, this, this understanding. Now, when we get to the uh, low density and high moisture content, we are in the clays, I have more, more room to, to do it. Uh, so this shows you the process control is very, very important, especially when you bring your bases and especially when you make it very high quality and get rid of the fines, you know, pretty much, huh? You're getting, that's what it is. So, so the moisture content is very, very important. Now, there is another thing comes, the dry density that we usually work with, you can test on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the difference, dry density would be small. They're changing what's small, but Look at this. I'm showing you even the moisture content at the compaction versus the moisture content at testing. So these are the specimens that we artificially let in the laboratory dry. And it, it modules at the time of the testing and the modules at the time of the compaction. One is when the I start and the modulus of the, at the compaction and testing is the same. You see that if you let it go dry, there's a factor of eight difference when I let the material dry by the difference is 10%. This is the material around 20% moisture cut. So, and the, the sad thing is that after a while, it gets uh, unpredictable. You see that it goes everywhere. So you need a, you have a very small window of uh, air thing to do modulus based or performance based testing. Or the other way I'm saying that if I'm a contractor, all I have to do is wait. Material would pass by itself because when it loses moisture, it gets stiffer, right? Okay, so another detail. The other one is this uh, lab and field testing. I show you some of those small scales. Now we're gonna start uh, applying plate load tests and all the good stuff on top of it too. And in this case, we started uh, embedding a bunch of geophones uh, to measure the displacement at different, different areas inside the base, six inches of base over 400 millimeters of subgrade, you know and we start testing. So I would like to see if this is a simple model, how well I can, I can predict the, the response of this system, right? And the first thing we did, we did it with only one layer. There is no single layer, okay. So what I'm showing you over here uh, are three different uh, state of stress, 30 PSI, this is roughly what you get from the LWD and I increased it to 50 and 70 to, to go with the FWD, okay? And, uh, and the dots that you see is the experimental, error, uh, experimental numbers at different layers. So it's, uh, it's going non-linear and boy, it's, it's really doing a good job of it. Okay, now when I put the K1, K2, K3 that I got from my laboratory testing of the same material at the same moisture content at the same density, again, that's another thing my graduate students may Complain. I made them do trial and error till they get the same density that we got into the laboratory. Okay, so 
So you see that uh, this is what I'm getting. The pattern is there, but the, the values are not there. Okay. So if I just normalize the two over here, you see that there is a 40%, you know, the difference between the lab and field is 40%. So somehow what I'm getting in the lab and what I'm getting in the field is different. Now, this is nice because it's, everything is uniform and things like that. When you go at the layer, you're going to get a bunch of scatter. But you see the same thing. So some, somehow, there is a difference in the, in the lab and the field that I would like. And this is what we did. This is where the seismic comes because seismic, uh, there is no boundary condition. You can make the same measurement in the lab and the field. And you should get the same number, theoretically. And this is a modulus of the laboratory versus modulus uh, the laboratory at optimum. This is modulus of this uh, field versus modulus of the field at optimum. So we normalized it. And you see how tight, at least at the beginning. So this shows you, as the material dries out, how the, the ratio changes. Now, if I get this line and just put it over here, this is one-to-one -one line that you see over here. You see at the at the beginning, uh, you know, the normalized field is bigger than the normalized uh, lab. But after a while, the, the lab values start changing, but the field values get to the thing. This gets me back to one of the things that my mentor, uh, Frank McCullough, was saying that you can never get a modulus ratio more than three. This shows it's coming over here. So, so this is, this is the, be, uh, the behavior that you see. So, you can consider the lab versus field at least preliminary based on six materials that we have over there. I would like you to now go to a field uh, field section and just show you some of the the, the results that uh, that uh, that we have. So this is uh, we drove a contractor nuts. We said that we want three different sections, each 150 feet. Uh, I want one exactly 2% dry of optimum, one exactly at optimum, and the other one 2% uh, above optimum. Okay, each, each one of them, okay. So if, if you lose a friend that way. You know, just, so keep doing it and doing it till you get the density as best as you can. Okay. And then we just, for each of those 150 foot sections, we are running 2-4. You see that uh, the, 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 the grid of testing that you see to just characterize it. And intelligent compaction is involved over here as well. Okay. And as you see, there is an army of people with uh, any tool that you can imagine or just running around making those measurements at those, those grids. Okay. So I would just first you to show you the intelligent compaction. So this is uh, the, 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 the whole section, for instance. Uh, the CMV is a value that, uh, gener that shows you the quality of compaction in the intelligent compaction. A high CMV it means that you have a, a compacted uh, material, a low is not. This is a distribution, and I like to look at the cumulative distribution, as you see over here, as a definition. Okay, so let's test something. This is the, for the dry. You see after the third pass, after the sixth pass and uh, after the ninth pass, uh, uh, I'm getting to this. By the way, all of these, they pass density. So we just roll till we pass density. That's another guy you drive nuts, the density guy, okay. <laughs> okay. Now, let's go to the optimum. This is after the third pass. You see, after the sixth pass, I'm getting my uh, higher. The nine pass is not doing me any good. After the six pass, I'm getting it over there. So that, that experience uh, pan out. Now let's go to the wet one. The, the wet one, this is the pass three. And pass six and nine, I'm going backwards. I'm making it softer. I'm just basically rolling it, and I cannot control it. So, so some of the things that you see, so moisture content matters, right? So. Dry off. Uh, now, the other thing, now we just uh, map the layer. This is the embankment they're building. We map the layer before, then map the layer after. So, so you cannot hope to have a better quality than the layer below, right? Because they have been sitting over there and it's been uh, dry. And this one shows you that, okay, when I'm dry or when I am uh, at the optimum, I can essentially get the same quality that I, I, I had placing it on. 
uh, when I'm going on the wet, after 11 passes, this will route the 9 passes. You see that I'm just uh, not, not even getting close to that. This is what the practice is usually, at least in Texas, you know, you'll just play it wet. Uh, for, du for, uh, for durability and high, you may probably want to put it at optimum or dry. It's easier to put it wet, but, but that's what you're going to do. And then we get over here, there is no correlation between density and CMV, clearly, and simply because the density and the stiffness, they are not related. They are complementing each other, they are not correlated. There are two different phenomena. Uh, when they went to a production section, this is the section that they, they, we are they're testing and uh, we, we tested again. I would like to now show you that this is not controlled moisture, right? The real section, the control, uh, the moisture content is going so between 16 to 24, huh? Okay. The density is passing 105 is the passing density. Every single one of them is passing, but I'm going from 108. Well, let's forget about this 124. That is a couple of points. Uh, to 116, okay. Are you surprised that I get this distribution of the modulus? So if you want a more uniform modulus-wise, you know, we need to, we have work ahead of us. I don't have the solution, I'm just giving you the problem okay. uh, to look at. So I, 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 I know I'm going over, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna stop after this for now. Uh, some of the institutions, or one of the things that comes up is the manpower is the issue. You know, if you increase the number of testing that you want to do, then we, we already hear that, you know, there are less and less manpower, you know, it's going to get. Uh, budget limitation, this always comes up when we talk to the, to the guys who decide that we don't have. Uh, this is an example, the aerospace industry. Of course, aerospace is not, uh, it's very more critical than we are. 85% of the budget of a part is quality control. So it costs 15 cents to build a pay, uh, uh, something, and 85 cents to make sure that they build it right. In our business, this is a very generous number that uh, Marshall knows, right? <laughs> Highway construction, less than 2% goes to the, to, the, to the quality. Maybe we can bump it up a little bit, right? Okay. Uh, and just you get the context of the risk involved in premature fire. If we can improve the uniformity, you know, if we can reduce this. These are expensive, you know. I don't know how much it is to close a lane in Chicago for a day. I, I don't want to even imagine. Uh, that pays by, uh, for itself, for, uh, the, for hour of that, pays for all the laboratory tests that I'm asking to do before you build it. <laughs> And then the, the other is just how to get the buyout of everybody, and this is very justifiable. Uh, uh, the contractors, uh, they don't know how to give you the modulus because they don't have experience. And when I uh, feel like a smart guy, I ask them, okay, 40 years ago, you had no clue how to get the density, so how, come, uh, how did you get it? Why don't we can go through the same process with the modulus, right? But it takes time, so you have to work with it. They had no clue how to get density, right? But they, thought, they figured it out. So anyway, so, and the, the DOTs are usually are concerned about the backlash of the delays and things like that to the public and then uh, Frankly, we as academicians pushing it a little bit uh, more than we should. Uh, uh, so, so these are all that we have to consider. So another institution is risk management. That was the issue of the sensitivity I was talking. This is 10-65, and it shows you there are, there are known defects that the Harold von Quintus built in the project the day before, and then they hired a bunch of uh, consultants to come. They didn't know where the thing, find the, the, the defects, huh? And the defects were marked, but you know, you didn't know which one is good or not, you know? And so seismic found 86, deflection 64, density 44. But then it's the issue of the variability. Okay, 30%, 20%, 10%, so. So you need to sensitivity versus variability you to do it. Uh, 
uh, to consider. And I would, I know I'm going over, but this is fun. I just want to uh, uh, show it to you. This is a recent project we, uh, we did, and this is intelligent compaction project. OK, so the way it works, intelligent compaction, find the loose spots, and then go and LWD is not acceptable because it's variable, so we're going to run plate load tests, right? Plate load test is a gold standard. OK, so this is what they did. This is, uh, and I guess the CMV, when it's green, uh, it means that it's good. When it's red, it means that it's uh, below, below, and yellow is, we don't know what to do. OK, so they decided on these five points, one, two, three, four, five. And this is the five because we do some of the good ones and some of the bad ones, you know, so that you see what the difference is. And they do the plate load test. And five is pushing it in a day. Five plate load tests in a day is pushing it. Okay. So what we did, we just went to one of these points, you know, get the plate load test and got a modulus of 43 KSI. Okay. At the time that he was guy was running, we had 15 points around here, and we run LWD and DCP. I'm just showing you the LWD and DCP. Okay, these are 15 points that you see the pluses. Okay, so this is the contour map of the modulus in that area. So this would be six feet by uh, 12 feet around the test point. Okay, I'm not talking about hundreds of. Them. This is the variability that we get. And this is, uh, it's, I don't have time, but in DCP you see it's the same thing. Okay. So you sat down for two and a half hours to get this st gold standard number. Oh. What if you put this plate of uh, two feet in either side? Because the GPS, uh, they say we know submillimeter. We don't. We know around 10 feet uh, on the application. So if, if this is the certainty of the GPS, If instead of putting the plate, and it, then again, you know, we, we surrounded it because that was the guy, huh? So if you put it over here, you're going to get uh, 26, 27. Over here is 43. What is it? Let's look at all five of them, huh? Is it worth it to sit down for two and a half hours on one point to get this, to get one number? So we need to start uh, looking a little bit at uh, being less idealistic, huh? Just maybe a little faster with a more certain uncertainty at different at more points is a not a bad idea. It's not perfect, but uh, now to be honest with you, we did, if you look at the density density between two uh, different machines and the moisture content, they are not as uh, very rosy either. You know that you know, but we are used to it. So so there are issues to complete. Uh, what I would do, I would stop over here, you know. I had some more, but I didn't think I would talk that much. But uh, talking a little bit about asphalt and concrete. But I would stop uh, over here and just go all the way to the, to the conclusion. Uh, well. Anyway, I, the conclusion is obvious, right? <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> So the bottom line is that you know we're just trying to balance the performance design and the, the and, and the material. Right now we are learning. Uh, right now we are not teaching. Uh, there are a lot of uh, issues that we still have to address. The promise is there, but you know we we need to work together. You know we need a little bit of the positive attitude. You know just let us solve it. Uh, from academician side of us, let us not say that we solved the problem. Uh, and um, we are hoping that from the DOT side, they don't say that, you know, we are given up on you and, and so on and so forth. There is promise, but we have a long way, and hopefully the next generation that you guys are coming up, you know, just something to look into to, to solve it. Uh, and bottom line, each one, even the ones that are ex fully accepted, they have a lot of technical and institutional issues. They are accepted because people build consensus. Okay, so uh, 
Um, let's, let's go ahead and uh, just define, take advantage of the advantages, and then let's see if we can minimize the disadvantages to come up with a way. Some of the DOTs already, for instance, uh, Indiana next door is already gone modulus, and Nebraska is on the other side. Oh, I forgot my geography. Nebraska geography and myself, we don't go together. They are going that way. It's a little bit further, okay. Yeah. So that's what I said. I had a couple of other ones. One has to do what's the real strength of the concrete? Because with concrete, we get the strength from 28 days in the water. The roads, we don't sink them for 28 hours in the water at 70 degrees. Okay, what's the implication of that? The other one I have, you know, just going to asphalt from density to to, to modulus. Okay, can we get the lab modulus in the field? Yeah. Uh, things like that. But there are a lot of issues over here that, you know, uh, performance uh, brings it up, and we can solve it. It's just that it takes time. I appreciate your patience, and thank you. I know I went over, but, but I appreciate it. Do we have time for questions? Yes. Uh, it's my uh, perspective that until such time as we start doing uh, analysis, structural analysis, based on a procedure that considers stress-dependent properties and granular materials and subgrades, we're going to have a very, very difficult time of matching up lab and field. Yeah. It's not uncommon, as you well know, to look at a set of back calculations. And the subgrade has a higher modulus than a dense graded high quality aggregate base course if you say this is not right. Yes. right. That's a Chuck Schwartz and I are, that's our mission. We're both getting old, by the way, so we may not accomplish that. <laughs> no, no, you guys, both of you have a good uh, 20, 30 years in you. Uh, that's why we, have, uh, we, are, we are working on that area as well, but, but again, you know, I approach it that, you know, first, uh, I went seismic first because the state of stress is irrelevant. There are two issues. One is the state of stress, the other one is the compaction. The third one is age. These, these three. So we, hopefully uh, you guys can address the state of stress, we're going to address the, the other issues that we can come back together. No, but I, I just really agree. That's what I was saying, that depending on the how simplified your model is, you may want to simplify or complicate your quality control. Any other questions? I was trying to be provo provocative. I wasn't very successful. <laughs> That's what I like to do in the university. <laughs> You mentioned about a few states already adopting the, uh, or have already adopted modulus space, right? Yes. Indiana and... Uh, Indiana and Nebraska. Nebraska. That's it. But Minnesota has been working on uh, that. Minnesota project. is uh, shadow. <laughs> shadow spectrum, specifying. Uh, right now, uh, I was working with the Indiana DOT, and we needed a nuclear density gauge uh, that was owned by the state. There were three of them, and they were all kilo hundreds of kilometers away. They basically sold all the nuclear density gauges. They have three left. The, the same with Minnesota. They don't use nuclear gauge. The, well, the, the, the Minnesota never used nuclear gauge. Their acceptance was always based on the sand cone. Mm -hmm. A lot of states, they do sand cone. They never actually. The contractor has a nuclear density gauge, but you know that's for, that's for the quality control. But they do sand cone, for example. You know, the Indiana guys are now using DC. Or for the software, yeah. For the software, for the base yeah. they use their yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, LWD was used pretty much by Minnesota, so and then the deflections they are checking, you know, yeah. deflections wow. that they suck to them, you know. To and there are other institutional so. issues, you know. Have that in mind. There is a two thousand dollars for a LWD versus uh, for a PCP versus a non office consultant for a LWD. But then the manpower that we need to run there, but it's good. the problem is that we need to the next generation that they come out, we need to preach a little bit so that they some of the problems that you see that delightful problems with the back calculations, 
because those are the next generation that they believe so much that they don't check the numbers. You and I, we look at the numbers and I said, no, there is another option, an answer that is more correct. But the new generations, we taught them so well that whatever the modulus, for instance, in Texas spits out, that's what they go with it. So hopefully but, but do you think modulus-based, like compaction control and co lift control, will be adapted eventually? I, I think that eventually everybody would go that way. Uh, it takes time, you know. Even though there are difficulties like the moisture. There, there are difficulties. Again, uh, I, I didn't, I, I tried to behave. <laughs> <laughs> we had, uh, that, uh, that project that I showed you, we had uh, two nuclear density gates. Both of them calibrated the day before. Do you want me to show you the data of the two nuclear density gates? This is going the same hole. I'm, I'm not talking about even going and uh, we drilled the hole and we, they put the <coughs> nuclear density gate. No. We have it over there, but it's defense, 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 how much we want to... Right now you are having a Chevy and you are having a good time with it. Everybody is happy all of a sudden. Uh, we are... Uh, they say that, okay, I'm, I'm not going to live with the Chevys of the modular space specification. I want a Maserati. If until you don't give me the Maserati, I'm not going to do the Chevy. Yes. That, that's, that's the thing. But some of them, like Minnesota, like uh, right now in Texas and the other one, they're just changing the, the, okay. I have to, that's what I went to risk at the beginning. I have to accept some risk. Right now, I'm having a lot of risk, and we see it, you know. So maybe we can do a little bit. If, if we accept a little bit better, uh, it would have been invested and it would have implemented it all. The problem is that we want it to be 100% better. There is an IC spec in Texas, right, uh, in yeah, use. Yeah. So how is that working? IC spec, you know that we started looking at it uh, uh, very judiciously. And we very quickly realized that the IC is a process control, is not at this moment, is not a quality control or a quality acceptance. So the first thing we did, we stripped it down to two pages. And the first uh, step is uh, you contractor build it as you wish. We are not dictating to you how to use intelligent compaction. All we want you when you're satisfied that it's finished map. Yeah. So, so we map uh, before you put a layer, we map the layer after, and we only looking for a relative soft or relative... Uh, you have some uh, records or like performance metrics to compare like in projects that have used the conventional density versus the newer method like intelligent compaction, modular space, and C. What's going to happen long term if you're moving to that direction? It's going to pay off, like in terms of performance uh, record, which project is better? Is there there is run? some. The only people who, there are two actually, there's one paper that came out that, you know, cost benefit of uh, intelligent compaction. I wish I could remember. I'm getting older, I don't know. Uh, it just came out in the, actually, it's in transportation the geotechnical transportation geotechnical. Uh, of Wyoming, Wyoming guys. Well, yeah, they did a cost benefit of the intelligent compaction and the module space, you know, they did it. The other one is Minnesota because Minnesota has a longer history than anybody else. So, so uh, they, the they, they are just now looking because the operating war is long term. My opinion, we are not ready to do long term monitoring. We still have some uh, issues, even with the intelligent compaction. We have to back up based on, you know, I'm, I'm new in the intelligent compaction. I, 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 I got into it in 2011. And based on what I knew, uh, we started uh, peeling the onions and one by one, you know, we had to back up from some of the assumptions that... Uh, Who's the guy that Oklahoma or Oklahoma State is trying to, he's with the, the Volvo, <coughs> Volvo is doing a lot of work in trying to go from intelligent compaction data to predicting the quote, that's density. It, yes. That's a it's professor far out stuff. Oh. Professor Kamu. <laughs> There's also a polar project right now, polar using the intelligent compaction. It's related to the, like, the mm -hmm. images as well. Yeah, they would fly it. Just start. 
Well, for, uh, for me, uh, uh, if you, anything mechanical and density, they don't correlate. Uh, it's a physics. <laughs> and uh, sorry, you know, that's a strong uh, uh, statement. Stiffness and uh, intelligent compaction and, and modulus uh, do. Moisture does, but density and uh, empirical relationship it is. That's why we go to some sites and we have glorious success, and sometimes we go and you see we get orange point of zero. I mean, because these are two different phenomena. Yeah. You know, an issue though that that pop up, modulus is one thing. Yes. And play shear strength is quite something else. Of course. And I think sometimes we uh, get uh, in a position where we overemphasize modulus and don't bring in the cap shear strength. No. And we're getting trouble. No, I totally agree with you. But we don't, uh, we are abandoning all the, the methods that we're considering. We shouldn't, but especially for low volume roads, we shouldn't. But uh, the thing is, one by one, every state is forgetting about it. What you guys pioneered a few years ago, because now the modulus is more sexy. Yeah. Yeah. Bringing shear strength back into permanent deformation calculation. Yeah, but that, that I guess going through the circle too, not as the circle that included. But he's talking about one low, you know, big. right? Thanks again. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for your patience.